So as the pressure for sort of innovation and focus on performance comes in, Meryl, can you just comment? One of the interesting things I think is uh, about Vera's work is that um, it's always comes always comes down to some kind of internal champion that in a government <laughs> agency <laughs> to think about how do you move anything. And um, this uh, um, paradigm shift from saying government, you ought to sort of refine and reform how you run and manage programs versus government. You ought to think about how do you invest and partner with other uh, excellent organizations to achieve the goals of your agency. And then I'm going to ask you this at the same thing. So how do you think that will be received internally? Like what strategies would you suggest to help uh, government be more open, um, particularly um, if you get into the line staff? Of government, just because this is sort of the direction that I think you know a lot of the orientation is going, and as Kim mentioned, it might be sort of a little bit of a paradigm shift from a notion of the way that government achieves change is to develop and grow its own, you know, with government employee kind of mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. to one in which it's a more integrated through investment funds and other mechanisms. Well, I guess I don't think that they're mutually mm -hmm. exclusive. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The kind, you know. We, the bread and butter of our work at Vera was finding Lissettes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People who understood that their position of power could make change mm -hmm. in a broad way. But the change could be as simple as easing up the procurement yeah, rules. Procurement. <laughs> right, the bane it's of all huge. our existence. Um, is the, the, and New York Cities are particularly bad. But so, so there's lots of ways that government can contribute, and some of it is about just changing the way it interacts with the sector, which can mm -hmm. be um, structural issues around procurement and contracting and, and those things. Some of it are things that government should do, right? The work that I did, which was largely in the justice system, that you don't outsource policing. Right? Or you mm -hmm. shouldn't be outsourcing policing. Mm -hmm. You don't outsource mm -hmm. um, school safety. You don't outsource your immigration power. You don't outsource many, many things that are, mm -hmm. again, and all the things I did were justice functions. Mm -hmm. You don't outsource your justice system in a, in a democracy, mm -hmm. uh, nor should you. And so finding efficiencies and innovations, right? When I keep saying efficiencies, the only way to sell innovation to government when you're asking government to do it is to find them the savings in their own budget. So all of these notions about reinvesting criminal justice dollars in the community is because we saved them those dollars by, you know, you, every time you shut down, let's say, f give or take 50 beds in a prison, you've saved a chunk of change. Shutting mm -hmm. down one bed, no good. Not worth anything to government. We're talking big size dollars making a difference. You save 50 beds, you can build something in a community. And so you can partner with a not-for-profit to run an alternative program in a community, but you've had to make the change within a system mm -hmm. that should never be outsourced. And so I do think of the two as related, and the mm -hmm. trick is, is showing everybody the mutual benefits of moving across that spectrum. Um, it really depends on who you um, how an administration defines itself. And I, I was fortunate, I've um, worked under Eli Siegel and in, in, um, working um, under um, this mayor and um, then Commissioner Mulgrave. You know, both are very clear. Everybody and anybody who wants to meet with you should meet with you. I mean, I tell you, I wouldn't say no to anyone who wanted to meet with me. It also fit with my ethics and values. Yeah, it just did. And so, um, and I have to say, that's a radical change. A lot of people were not used to that. And um, that really impacts how you think about procurement. Uh, it was for the first time we actually decided to do focus groups on procurement. Uh, they thought this was radical. Procurement's usually a word that it's like, you know, they talk about the three men in the room. Anybody read the power broker? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, it's literally, literally was the three men in the room. What's, Bruno's gone now. What's going to happen, right? Um, so state politics side to talk. But, um, and so the idea was that three people or one person would decide what the procurement is and it would be based on individual individual lobbying efforts. That was clear. That's the way government worked. In fact, a lot of us will pay money and we still work that way to do that. I said, you know what, I can't, if once my calendar started being filled with lobbyists, I said, I can't do this anymore. This is just not exciting for me, you know. And I said, we're just going to set up focus groups of nonprofits. They have to be a staff member at a nonprofit to give feedback on this. I mean, I still have to deal with the lobbyists. And we did that for about probably 150 organizations, 20 probably in each borough. We tried to have 20 in each borough. 
this was like radical. Like people thought this was like, and to me this was not radical, but this was radical. And I have to tell you, and the reason why we did it because I knew the procurement rules for one of the largest requests for proposals for out of school time. And I thought about Rich Bury, I thought about you, would assume that you have to have five years experience in the mm -hmm. field in order to get money. That is the number. Five is magical, it's your what's your toes, your fingers, for some reason in government, <laughs> they don't like less than five. I'm telling you, it's the truth. And so most nonprofits, if you look at the IRS, do not survive five years. It's like, a, it, you know, we talk about restaurants that go under in New York. You actually look, most of them do not survive five years because most of them are, you know, I have a dream and I'm just doing one thing and I closed out in a few years. So the truth is, once we, what I want to do is get enough of this group, yes, I staged my own internal thing, um, to say, let's get rid of the five-year thing, let's, let's leave it open to folks. And when I tell you, when we finally got that passed, that, that we could look at a criteria for experience other than years in business, it radically changed to applied. Radically changed to applied. And all of a sudden, you saw a whole new group of social entrepreneurs that love this mayor and love the commissioner. You would never have had a city year in the portfolio because they weren't in New York five years enough. We didn't care if you were in Boston. You would have never had Rich Bury and Groundwork who's like, that used his springboard. You wouldn't have had others. And what it's done is actually shake up how people think about things. We still had a lot of traditional organizations in there, but that's an example of trying to go outside of it. And there were a lot of Merrills who were interested in making sure that I had the right 20 people in each borough so that we can put it on record that this is what we needed to do. So, I mean.